Hi, my name is Gabrielle Bryson. I am the QA and Training Director at ViaQuest Psychiatric Behavior Solutions. This training is going to be about the reporting guidelines within VPBS. Um, this is specifically how ViaQuest Psychiatric Behavior Solutions um, is going to report incidents. The objectives for today is to learn different types of incidents and how they should be reporting for different organizations. So we're going to go over the process for reporting duty to warn or duty to protect, being mandated reporters for children protective services, adult protective services, including ombudsman, developmental disability, county board, ODMHAS, CA. RF, so ODMHAS and CARF. We'll go through those definitions here in a little bit. Felonies and criminal acts and animal abuse. Uh, for people who are licensed, please note any additional reporting that you have to do for your licensure, um, you will have to follow according to your license. We're also going to making sure that you guys understand how to report an incident and learn how to complete the incident notification form. Um, so that's everything that you're going to be learning in this training module here. You will have to have the incident notification form with you. Um, so please make sure um, if you don't have that right now, um, you can stop this video and we're actually going to fill one out together during this training. So if you could please get that. The other thing that I'm going to reference is, it's going to be a little business card saying, what should I report? Um, on the front of it and on the back of it, it will notate different things that we're gonna go over today in training of what is considered a reportable incident. It's going to have the reporting hotline number and the process timeframes of how you should report it. So that is given to all new hires during their new hire and orientation, in-person training, and it's going to be in the front sleeve of your binder there. Um, if you weren't given one or if you misplaced it, you can get a new one from your supervisor and office managers who create the binders. Um, for new staff or ongoing staff members, excuse me, for current staff members, um, we have additional ones. So if you misplace it or if you need a new one, it got, got wet or got damaged, you can request a new one anytime and we'll be more than happy to give you a new one. So um, this is reference to company policies that we have here. Um, so the company policies that I'm gonna reference in this training is the core 7.1414 rights of individuals serve policy. Um, so it's important to making sure that all of our staff know the mental health client rights. Um, we're not gonna fully review them here in this training, but we're gonna reference them. And I wanna make sure that you guys know what the rights are so we're not violating them, okay? And then this whole policy is going to be a breakdown of, I'm sorry, this whole video is going to be a breakdown of the VPS VPBS 12.23 Incident Notification and Risk Management Policy. Um, so you can reference that policy too. These policies should be part of the training module for you. Um, these handouts you can reference anytime. You can also get these policies and procedures off of my ViaQuest um, on the internet in the policy procedure section under my company. And you can access those anytime. They are reviewed and updated annually, so you can review those as many times as you'd like. Um, they are gonna be sent out on company emails on if there's any changes to any rights or any notifications on incidents that we have to report. Okay, so that's, um, once again, I'm gonna be referencing the incident notification form and what should I report card. Um, and that's gonna be really important for you to guys have there. Um, so once again, if you do not have those, please go ahead and stop this video and get those before we move forward in this training. All right, so let's get started. We're gonna talk first about client rights. Um, so there are different types of client rights. Um, we uh, are credited through, once again, ODMHAS. So we have mental health client rights. So you may have heard of 
development disabilities client rights and other type of client rights. Um, but for our organization, um, we have to ensure that we provide clients mental health client rights. Um, so all clients are going to be informed of their mental health rights at the start of services and annually. So when we're going through consents, um, we're going to give them um, their client rights and which is in the handbook. Um, so the rights are posted in every office and within the client handbook. Um, we provide to clients and guardian to sign off on at the beginning of treatment. And then we should be reviewing those annually in session. Um, so this should be part of a regular session that you're doing with clients annually. In the client handbook, we want to make sure that we are reviewing the client rights, the grievance process, the expectations of a client, and the services they can receive here at BioQuest um, within PBS. Um, and that should be re reviewed with clients annually. Um, every year we have to update the client's rights. And so after each um, annual review, um, I'm sorry, after every update of each year's handbook, you should be reviewing that with your clients. Um, all staff need to make sure their clients, our guardians are able to understand their rights and use any form of communication. So we do have some clients who speak, who may, who maybe English is not their first language and or that we have clients who are um, ASL, so who are us, uh, who do sign language. So we might wanna make sure that, that we are interpreted in a way for them to understand. Um, you'll also notice at the bottom here that you'll see a quiz reminder. Um, you are able to pull up the quiz and take it throughout the training here, um, or you'll be able to pull it up at the end and take the quiz at the end of this training. Um, but this slide is referencing a quiz answer. All right, so let's get into the reporting information here. Um, so if there's any potential incidents, you want to call the incident hotline, and that number is 844-487-1265. You'll want to save that number in your phone um, so you have access to that at any time. So you don't want to be in, an, in a crisis situation with your client or need to report an incident and don't have the number. Um, you want to report it as soon as possible, so immediately or within one hour discovery. Um, there are time frames that we have to ensure that reporting incidents in a timely manner. Um, on the incident hotline, it is clinical supervisors, um, so people who have their independent license, that you'll be able to reach. There are supervisors throughout the state, um, so you'll be able to be able to reach one of the one of one of them. So, if there is no answer, leave a voicemail with your name and contact information. Um, please remember, for any type of voicemails you leave, you never want to leave any PHI, so personal health information. Um, so, don't leave the client's name or anything like that. Just state, "Hi, my name is Gabrielle Bryson. I am from." this region, I would like to report an incident if you can call me back at this number. Okay, so just very simple voicemail like that. So if a supervisor has not called you back, call the incident hotline again within 10 minutes of first attempt. All incidents should be discussed over phone before any additional steps are taken. Okay, so when the supervisor calls you back, it will be from their number or their office number. Um, so this, the 844 number will not show. Um, so please be mindful, it may not be number, it may not be a number that you have in your phone, um, but they should be calling you back within 10 minutes of receiving your voicemail. Um, please make sure you leave a voicemail so they know that, they're, that you're calling um, for them to call you back. Okay, so after another 10, 15 minutes, um, if after 25 minutes you're not able to reach a supervisor on the incident hotline, please text and call me, um, the QA and training director. So you can save my cell phone also. That is my personal cell phone number. So if you could please text me to let me know who you are, because I do not have all the staff members' numbers saved in my phone. And we have over 200 plus employees here at ViaQuest. Uh, for PBS, so please make sure that you text me saying, hey, Gabby, incident call, can't reach the incident hotline, um, and then I will ensure that I answer or that I give you a call back as soon as possible. 
So the timeframes for all reporting will incidents. Um, so all employees of uh, VPBS uh, will report all incidents in, to the incident hotline. And once again, there's a number, 844-487-1265. Reports to the incident hotline needs to be completed immediately or within one hour discovery. If directed, you will contact the departments within four hours. And we're going to review the different uh, the different departments here in a little bit. Once you do the phone call, you want to complete the incident notification form, and then you want to email it to me. So my email is there. Um, Gabrielle.bryson at viaquestinc.com. And you want to make sure you're done with that by the end of the business day. So you want to make sure you email it, email it to me. Um, the the um, supervisor on the incident hotline will give you their name um, for you to also CC them on the emails to making sure that you are completing that by the end of that day. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna to get to different types of reporting items. So the first one is duty to warn and duty to protect, okay? Um, so violent behaviors of the client. Um, so this may happen sometime throughout your employment here, um, but these are the regulations that we have to follow according to um, Ohio regulation code. So staff may be held liable in damages in a civil action or may be made subject to disciplinary action license board, a regulatory of agency for serious physical harm or death resulting from failure to protect, warn of, or take precautions to prevent, to provide protection from a violent behavior of a client, okay? Only if the client or knowledgeable person has communicated to staff or the agency an explicit threat of inflicting immediate imminent Im serious physical harm to or causing the death of one or more clearly identified potential victim. So staff and agency may have a reason to believe that the client has the intent and ability to carry out the threats and staff and uh, agency fails to take action in a timely manner. So this means that the client has means, attempts, and reasons to potentially hurt somebody or hurt people or an organization or an, a facility, okay? Um, if they have means and we are aware of that, but we do not take action, um, that, that could lead to additional issues, okay? So there are four different actions that we can take in order for self and public safety. So the first one, um, the first option, according to regulation, is that um, hospitalize the client on an emergency base utilizing involuntary hospitalization. Um, so we do reference the VPS 12.09 involuntary hospitalization policy. Um, that is how um, we are able to potentially hospitalize someone for the safety of, them, of themselves or others. So our nurse practitioners can pink slip clients. Um, for our other staff, you will have to, if it's in office, maybe we can get an NP to pink slip them. If not, then we'll need to call EMTs um, or 911 to see if they can come up and evaluate the client and hospitalize them. The better option is to have the client voluntarily hospitalized. Um, so the client is willing to be hospitalized and be able to work through those policies. Excuse me, we've worked through those problems, problems um, to reduce those potential homicidal or harm to other thoughts. The third option here is establish and undertake a document treatment plan that is reasonable, reasonably calculated according to appropriate standards of professional practice. So want to eliminate the possibility that the client will carry out the threat and concurrent with establish and undertaking the treatment plan. Initiate arrangements for a second opinion risk assessment through a management consultation um, about the treatment plan. Um, so basically what this is stating is that we'll get a second opinion and have someone else do a risk assessment on the client. Um, currently ViaQuest do not contract with um, a consultant to do that. Um, so this is not an option that PBS employees will mostly take. We will most, most likely do one, two, or four. Okay, so four states that we would communicate to law enforcement agencies of the jurisdiction in the area where the client or where the victim resides, excuse me. 
where a structure threatened by a mental health client is located or the mental health client resides. We want to communicate to each potential victim or victims, parent or guardian of the victim, um, if it's a minor, of these following items. So we want to make sure that we let them know the nature of the threat, the identity of the client who is making the threat, and the victim. Okay, so we want to make sure that we tell them all the information we know to provide the proper notification. So if we do any of the four, um, we want to consider each of the alternatives set forth and shall document the reasons for choosing or rejecting each alternative. Um, and you'll be doing that within your progress notes, okay? Um, you wanna document very thoroughly in your progress notes of the reasons of the, the option or the choice that you took. Um, you may wanna give special consideration to those alternatives, which consistent with public safety would least abridge the right of the client's confidentiality. Okay, so if the client can voluntarily hospitalize themselves, that would be great, um, or involuntarily pink slipping the client um, or contacting the police is one going to be one of our three options there. Um, staff organization is not required to take an action that is in the exercise of reasonable professional judgment, but physically endanger the professional or organization, increase the danger to a potential victim, or increase the danger to the client. Staff and organization is not liable in damages in a civil action. It should not be made subject to disciplinary action by the entity with licensing, licensing or other regulatory authorities over the professional organization for disclosing any confidential information about a client that is disclosed for the purpose of taking actions for uh, taking any actions. So this is the only time or one of the only times where we are going to be protected to uh, of disclosing confidential information about the client for the safety of others and the safety of the client, okay? Um, but it should be within these parameters. So if you do have to do one of these type of reports, we always wanna make sure that you and the client are safe um, and others are potentially safe. Then once you're able to ensure that everybody's safe, you wanna call the incident hotline to discuss the appropriate ways of how to deal with this situation. Maybe if we can get the client pink slips or if we have a nurse practitioner or they'll guide you on who to call and how to contact, okay? Actions outlined before will be taken for the safety of the community, victim and client immediately or within one hour of safety. If directed, notify appropriate people as soon as possible within four hours, okay? And like I said, you're gonna be documenting this in your progress note. Justifications of your actions. You're gonna notate the ideations, intent, and means, okay? Justifications of why we took the steps. Client maybe not agreeing to safety plan. Client has access to guns or state that he's going to do X, Y, Z at this time, um, which is what led you to do those actions there, okay? So now we're gonna get into Child Protective Services. We're gonna start with a little video. Consent for kids. This is you. Okay, it doesn't look exactly like you, but let's say it's you. This is your body, and you get to decide what you do with your body. No one else is entitled to tell you what to do with your body. Not your friends, not strangers, not adults you know. No one is entitled to decide what you do with your body except you. That's called bodily autonomy, by the way. And that's what consent is all about. Everyone is different. Some people love to hug, and some people hate hugs. And each person gets to decide what they're comfortable with. Can a hug-loving person just start hugging someone at random? Nope. They need consent. How do people know if they have consent? They ask. Would you like a hug? Yes, I would. Can I hold your hand? I'd rather not. Okay. If a person doesn't say yes... Can I hug you? Um, I, uh... 
and they haven't given their consent. It's really pretty simple. Ask for consent, listen to the answer. By the way, if a person bribes someone or threatens someone to say yes, that's not consent. Sometimes adults will try to tell a kid what to do with their body. Go kiss Aunt Doris goodbye. But the kid still gets to decide. No thanks, that makes me uncomfortable. I'll just wave goodbye. Some things kids can't consent to. They can't enter into legal contracts. They can't vote. And they can't consent to sexual stuff. Because they're kids. So if an adult does something that kids can't consent to, that's not okay. The adult is wrong, and it's not the kid's fault. And that's why it's most important to tell a trusted adult, like a teacher. Why? Because it's your body. And no one else is entitled to tell you what to do with it. Practice consent. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that video. It's a cute little video about consent for kids. So we wanted to get into the definitions of what is considered abuse for children. Um, for some people, they may not have worked with children before, so we want to make sure that you guys have some information about it, okay? Um, so this is the definition of what abused child is, okay? So victims of sexual activity is endangered as defined in um, Ohio Regulation Code 2919.22. So putting the, client, the, the child in danger. Exhibits is evidence of any physical or mental injury of death, injury or death inflicted other than by accidentally me, accidental means or an injury or death, which is a variance within the history given of it. Because of the act of his or her parent or guardian custodian suffers physical or mental injury that harms or threatens to harm the child's health or welfare and is subject to out of home care child abuse. Um, so, for example, sending them to Uncle Joey's house, um, but Joey is a known um, child pedophile or something like that. Neglect is abandoned by their parents or guardian or custodian, lacks adequate parental care because of the faults or habits of their parents, guardian or custodian, parents, guardian, custodian neglects the child or refuses to provide proper or necessary substance, um, substance, education, medical or surgical care or treatment or other care necessary for the child's health, morals or well-being. And the parent, child, or, uh, parent, guardian, custodial neglects the child or refuses to provide the special care made necessary by the child's mental conditions. The parent, guardian, or custodian has placed or attempted to place the child in violation of ORC 5103.16 um, and 5103.17. Um, so that generally that is in regards to child placement of like foster care or adoption and things like that that best suits the client's need. Um, because of the emotion, the omission of the child's parent, guardian, custodian suffers physical or mental injury that harms or threatens to harm the child's health or welfare, and is subject to out of home care, child neglect. So we're going to get into some signs and symptoms of what you potentially may see if you work with children um, and you see this is the first one of child abuse. So these are some signs and symptoms that you may see. Um, there's always been, or I shouldn't say always, there's potentially going to be sudden changes in child's behavior and potentially their school performance. Um, child is um, has not received help for physical or medical problems brought to the parent's attention and the child has learning problems or difficulties concentrating that cannot be attributed to special physical or psychological causes. So signs and symptoms of child abuse within the child. Um, so the child potentially may always be watchful as they're preparing for something bad to happen, lacks adult supervision, is overtly compliant, passive, or withdrawn, comes to school or other activities early in or stays late, 
and does not want to go home. Some things you may see within the parent or caregiver, shows little concern for the child, denies the existence of, of or blames the child for the child's problems in school or at home, asks teachers or other caregivers to use harsh physical discipline if the child misbehaves, sees the child as entirely bad, worthless, or burdensome, demands a level of physical or academic performance the child cannot achieve, looks primarily to the child for care, attention, and satisfaction of emotional needs. And then in the interaction between them, you may see um, that they rarely touch or look at each other, consider their relationship as entirely negative, and states that they do not like each other. We're going to move into physical abuse of signs and symptoms of the child, has unexplained burns, bites, bruises, broken bones, or black eyes, has fading bruises or other marks noticeable after an absent from school, seems frightened of the parent and protests or cries when it's time to go home, shrinks at the approach of an adult and reports injuries by a parent or another adult caregiver. Physical abuse signs in the parent offers conflicting or unconvincing or no explanation for the child's injury, describes a child as evil or in some other very negative way, uses harsh physical discipline with the child and has a history of abuse themselves as a child. Let's move into neglect. So some things that you may see in the child, frequently absent from school, begs or stealing food or money, lacks needed medical or dental care like immunizations or glasses, is consistently dirty or has severe body odor, lacks sufficient clothes for the weather, abuses alcohol or other drugs, state that there is no one at home to provide care. So we do wanna be mindful about neglect. Neglect is one of the harder ones to potentially provide evidence or prove. Um, we also wanna be, um, be mindful of the parent's um, poverty uh, ability to provide things uh, like coats or um, things like that where maybe none of them have coats, you know, be mindful if they're just singling out that one child, but they're wearing a coat and maybe their other children are. And then body odor, especially around preteens and teens, um, is it them not showering because they're not using deodorant or is it because they've gone weeks and weeks without showering? Maybe they don't have any hot water. They have, they've smelled for days on end. Um, so just be mindful of those things when it comes to neglect. Um, some signs and symptoms for parents. Appears to be indifferent to the child, seems apathetic or depressed, behaves irrationally or in a bizarre manner, and abuses alcohol or other drugs. Moving to sexual abuse for signs and symptoms of a child, has difficulty walking or sitting, suddenly refuses to change for gym or to participate in physical activities, reports nightmares or bedwetting, experiences of sudden changes in appetite, demonstrates bizarre, sophisticated, or unusual sexual knowledge or behaviors, become pregnant, pregnant or contract a disease, particularly before the age of 14, runs away or reports sexual abuse by a parent or another adult caregiver. Signs and symptoms for a parent is unduly protective of the child or severely limits the child contact with others. Children, especially of the other of the other um, of the opposite sex, um, is secretive and isolates, is jealous or controlling with other family members. Um, so they really kind of isolate the child is what it's stating there. Emotional maltreatment. So signs and symptoms within the child shows extreme in behaviors such as overtly compliant or demanding behaviors, extreme passivity or aggression is either exhibiting inappropriate adult behaviors so parenting other children or inappropriate behaviors like head banging or rocking, um, is delayed in physical or emotional development, has attempted suicide or reports a lack of attachment to their parents. 
signs and symptoms of the parent or caregiver, consistently blames, belittles, or berates the child, is unconcerned about the child and refuses to consider, offers or helps for the child's problem or overtly rejects the child. So those are just a couple of signs and symptoms. Those are not everything that you would see, but those are some just common things. And you don't need to have all, um, you most likely need more than one um, to potentially report abuse. Um, so like I said, be mindful if you just smell body odor on the clients, that doesn't automatically trigger a report, but is it multiple days? Is it weeks, right? Um, is um, they're dirty, they're not able to, sh their teeth are not cleaned. Um, so just look into that, you know, um, but that leads into all of us being mandated reporters from AAs to our office managers, from our TBS to our NPs, to the directors and supervisors. Um, so we are all considered mandated reporters and should report all suspected abuse and neglect. Um, we are required by law to report if we suspect or know that any type of abuse and neglect is occurring. So we always want to keep the safety and welfare of the client in mind. And please be mindful that you do not have to have proof to make a report. Um, so it is not our job to investigate. Okay, it is just your job to report. There is never going to be any repercussions of making a report. And if the client is wanting to make a report of their neighbor or family member, they can make it anonymously. Um, and you can help the client through that process if that's something that they is that's really bugging them or would like they would like to do a report on. You can certainly help that client do that. Um, but you, as a um, clinician within a PBS, you want to make sure that you are giving them your name and stating that you're from. Via quest, um, and then they will also give us a follow up of what happened of their investigation. So, Children Protective Services applies for children who are under the age of 18 or mentally and physically handicapped children under the age of 21. So, once they go past those ages, um, they are no longer considered children um, and they will not open a case on their behalf. Okay, so what is the reporting guidelines for Children Protector Services? Um, so once again, you'll see that incident hotline number there, 844-487-1265. You wanna make sure that you're calling a supervisor on that hotline within one hour discovery. Once again, if they do not answer, please make sure you leave a voicemail and do not leave any PHI. Um, hopefully they call you back, but if they do not call you back within 10 minutes, please call again. So call the incident hotline again, um, and hopefully you'll be able to discuss it over the phone. Worst case scenario, they don't answer and it's been more than 25 minutes, you can call myself. Um, so once again, text me and then call me. Um, and please make sure you save the incident hotline number and save my cell phone number and we could be able to discuss the incident. So you'll be able to report it um, within four hours, okay? Um, so we are directed and we wanna make sure that we're calling the local county children protective services. And it's gonna be the county that the client resides in, okay? When you call them, they may or may not want the incident notification form, um, but you will need to complete it and uh, for our tracking purposes. And you are gonna email it to me at that email address, gabrielle.viaquest or gabrielle.bryson at viaquestinc.com. Um, when you see, if you're gonna CC them on the email, make sure you put in secure in the email address. Um, and then also, if you are getting a hold of someone on the incident hotline, um, they're gonna ask you to CC them on it to make sure that you completed the process correctly, okay? All right, so once again, contacting CPS. So these are some questions that they may ask you just to have yourself prepared of some things that they may ask you. Um, so the name and address of the child that you suspect is being abused, they wanna know the age, name and address of the parent or caretaker, if it's different from the child's, 
Name of the person you suspect is being is abusing or neglecting the child and the address if you have that. Reasons you suspect the child is being abused and neglected. Any other information which may help the investigation. Once again, give your name um, if you want clarification as we do of the investigation. So after report is done, as done, the CPS investigator will interview the child, family, or others as deemed appropriate. The investigator determines if the child is being abused or is at risk for abuse by conducting investigation, assessing the child's situation. The case may be referred to local social service agencies or juvenile family or criminal court. Um, so they're just investigators, so they don't prosecute, okay? Um, so they'll send it to the courts, or if it's something like social services, where maybe, like I said, maybe they don't have funding to buy coats, they may refer them to an agency that has coat drives or things like that. Once again, you will do this, you will do your reporting on the witness statement or on the incident notification form, and that will be sent to me. You physically filling out the form um, is not going to be put in your progress note and your documentation with the client. Um, so once you start, once you call the incident hotline, you are stopping your billing. Um, and then you're going to be calling the incident hotline, discussing the incident, calling CPS, um, to do this, to the incident. And that will all be notated on the incident form and not within the progress notes. Okay. All right. So if you have any additional questions about CPS, please make sure you follow up with your supervisor, um, for us to help you. Okay. Now we're going to get into adult, adult protective services. And here is a quick little video on APS. Adult Protective Services can be a tremendous asset for prosecutors. They'll be able to, to help prosecutors with the services that are available in the community. And more importantly, they've probably spent many hours already with the victim, uh, with the defendant, with family members. They're going to be able to tell prosecutors more about the case. They may also have information in their case records that the prosecutors don't know about. In some states, Adult Protective Service programs are able to do administrative subpoenas. So they may have bank records, medical records, or other records that might be very, very helpful. Also, in some states, Adult Protective Services may have done a forensic accounting or worked with a CPA, so there may be some documentations that the prosecutors aren't, aren't aware of. It's a great partnership when APS and prosecutors get together. How about your experience in building relationships with different government agencies, different service providers? And could you talk to us a little bit about your experience in that and how that's been important in working uh, to address elder abuse? The only thing that I've ever seen that worked is the person. So st I would suggest starting with an individual, talking to them about the special needs of older victims, even persons with disabilities, and start to build that relationship one-on-one. -on -one. The other thing I would say is to become a, a, an invaluable resource. The first thing you don't want to do to ask of anyone is to ask something of them. The best way to build a relationship is to, is to provide yourself as, as, a, as, as someone who can be helpful. The best way that I've seen is cross-training. Everyone needs to fulfill hours of training, every profession, even prosecutors and, the, and, the, and the different attorneys. And coming in and providing some, some cross-training on what is elder abuse, what to look for, what are the certain things that they should be aware of, what adult protective services can do. So that's the type, you start with individual relationships and through that you become more of an asset or a resource for someone. Then that opens the door for older victims and more of a dialogue and working relationship. When you think about the mission of an adult protective services agency, um, how can an agency like that help a prosecutor hold uh, perpetrators of elder abuse accountable? Adult protective services may be looking at gathering facts gathering facts to do substantiation, where prosecution is looking at what's the evidence-based prosecution that I can do. And that's where working together, uh, if we work together in the beginning and know what is needed on the back end, meaning holding 
perpetrators accountable, then Adult Protective Services could be a lot more effective partner in helping get that information and move it forward. When we did that initial home visit, have we done it together with law enforcement? Did we let the local prosecutor know that we think a crime may have been committed? Did we partner well there? And as we started to gather information, how did we document it? Can you share your investigative product, your, the work that you've been doing, uh, your case file, with a law enforcement investigator or a victim advocate? I can in the state of Maine. And once again, I check with the different statutes. Often written into the APS acts are that you can share with law enforcement, which is also includes prosecutors as well. So whatever I have, the prosecutor can get. And so victims that may have difficulty communicating or maybe are reluctant to communicate, um, is it ever possible to do joint interviews with law enforcement? It's preferable. The question that we should ask ourselves in Adult Protective Services is, do we think a crime has been committed? If the answer is yes at intake, then the first phone call ought to be to our prosecutor, if that's the protocol, or at least to law enforcement. Because if a crime has been committed, I need to be thinking about a couple of things, victim safety first, but evidence to help and hold the person accountable. So joint visits, if you have that relationship, it also is in the best interest of the victim. Don't make me tell my story 15 times. I'm going to get tired of telling the story, and I will stop talking. It's not because I'm older. It's because we're all normal. We all do it at any age. Try to have the victim tell the story as few times as they have to and have as many professionals available to help. Some of the best interviews that I have ever done has become because law enforcement has been with me, not because I thought of the questions or the cadence or the ways to, to ask the questions. It's because they did. We have a lot to learn, and law enforcement and prosecutors can help us in that area in ways that we might not even imagine until we do, do that joint visit, until we do that joint interview. We absolutely encourage joint visits. Um, anything that can help move the interview along. There are times where we can't get into a client's home because the abuser is there and the abuser is impeding our ability to interview. So we will call the police. We will have police escorts. We will go out with police. We go in New York City. We'll go out with the domestic violence officers. In other jurisdictions, I know that there are partnerships with law enforcement where joint visits are made. Some jurisdictions call them wellness visits, where they help us interview the person that's allegedly being abused. Is there any other sort of advice that you would like to give to prosecutors who handle elder abuse cases? When it works well, the relationship, a working relationship between law enforcement prosecutors and APS is a fine oil machine. And older victims get served in a way that none of us can imagine. When it doesn't work, and when we point fingers and blame each ourselves, the only one that suffers is the victim. The person who benefits is always the person who is, who is the perpetrator of this and not held accountable. I was taught by a prosecutor, Arlene Markarian, that it's not adult protective services job to prove the case. It, if we have a suspicion, it's our job to refer it to local law enforcement. And that's, that's what should be done. When we've gone out there and conducted an interview and determined that we believe the person is a victim of abuse, it is our job then to include law enforcement so that they can do their part. But we can work collaboratively so that we can safeguard this at-risk person. Can you give an example of where that collaboration might take place? When we've gone out to visit a person and we find that the person may have missing money. Their bank accounts have withdrawals, and we cannot um, identify who's withdrawing the money, but we suspect because there's a, there's a person with power of attorney. We would then refer that case, and whatever documentation that we have that gives us reason to believe that there's exploitation going on, we would forward that information to local law enforcement. I don't think that you can investigate elder abuse without having a relationship with prosecutors. There must be a relationship. There must be a relation, a working relationship where you can go back and forth, you can ask questions. There are times where I will call a prosecutor just to ask a question, not to report a case, but to ask a question. There's 
There are times where I will float a case by a, a, a prosecutor and vice versa. A prosecutor will call me and say, what do you think about this case? Is this an appropriate referral for APS? Is this an appropriate um, case where APS can intervene? All right, sorry for that pause. So I hope that gave you a great, great, um, a lot of information about Adopt Protective Services. Um, they did give a general overview. Um, so for the state of Ohio, um, that is through Ohio Department of Job and Family Services. Um, and they are the one that uh, governs over Adopt Protective Services, so APS. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, they only um, take cases for elder ages 60 and over. Okay, um, so unfortunately in the state of Ohio, between, between the ages of um, 18 or 21 and the age of 60, there is no um, department that you can report to um, for any type of issues there. But the cases they do take is who are people who are in danger um, of harm, unable to protect themselves or, and or no one else to assist them. So any forms of abuse, neglect, including self-neglect and exploitation, okay? So if they're gonna open up an investigation, they will do it within 24 hours in an emergency situation or within three working days after the report is received. Um, after investigation, the county department, JFS, Job and Family Services, determines whether or not the adult who is subject to the investigation is going to need protective services, okay? Um, so that is what they're gonna be doing. So this is referencing the incident hotline again. So you would call the incident hotline if you feel like APS needs to be called. Um, you want to make sure that they answer and hopefully be able to talk to you through the incident. If not, you wanna make sure you leave a voicemail with no PHI. Um, and if they don't call you back, make sure you call them again within 10 minutes, okay? Um, and then once again, worst case scenario, you can contact me. So we're always gonna be contacting the client's local APS, okay? So whatever county or city that the client lives in, that is the APS that you're gonna be calling. Um, if you're directed to call them. So once again, you always wanna call the incident hotline first and get that directive because they may be able to tell you to do other things first before you're calling APS. Um, so please make sure you're calling the incident hotline before you're calling APS. Then you're going to do the incident report, incident notification form. And that will need to be turned into me by the end of that business day. Okay, now we're going to get to ombudsman and knowing what the difference is. So ombudsman is through the Ohio Office of the State Long-Term Care Advocates. And they assist with people who are receiving home care, excuse me, assistive living and nursing home care. They do not regulate nursing homes and home health agencies, but work with them, work with providers, residents, and families to resolve problems and concerns. Okay, um, so they're more so of an advocate, okay? They're not regulators over the facilities, um, home health aides or anything like that. So this is what they can do. Um, they help resolve complaints about services, help people so, uh, select a provider and offer information about benefits and rights. Advocate for person-centered approach by providers um, to meet the needs and honor the preferences of residents link residents with services or agencies, offer resources for selected long-term care providers, and could provide information assistance with benefits and insurance, okay? Um, so generally, you always wanna call the incident hotline. Um, if the client is, and we're gonna get to that in here in a second, um, if the client is within one of our facilities, we're always going to, um, work with the facility to see if we can resolve the incident before we do any additional reporting 
the client always has the right to contact the unbusman as any time throughout the treatment with or without you. Okay. Um, but we're still going to follow the reporting process. You're going to call the um, incident hotline. Um, and if that is something that we want to help the client do in contacting unbudsmen, um, they have regional offices. Um, so they have multiple counties that are um, connected to unbudsmen. Um, there is a um, Ohio um, you know, state hotline that you can call that they can direct you to the regional one, but you can Google the regional unbudsmen um, for you to do that report. As always, all incident forms are completed and sent to me and not put in the client's chart. And that will be done by the end of that business day. Okay, so this is where we're gonna get into the LTCs. Um, so long-term care facilities, ICFs, facilities, whatever you guys would like to call them. I know they're different in each, uh, each, each county or area, um, but we do work a lot with facilities. So you, as you guys know, our main populations is the DD population and the facilities. Okay, long-term care facilities. Um, so any concerns of suicide, homicide, ideations, reportable incidents will need to be discussed with the supervisor on the incident hotline. Once again, there's the number. We want to make sure that we're done that, doing that as soon as possible within one hour discovery. Um, we will always want to try and resolve the incident with the facility and do reporting together. So generally most of the facilities will wanna take the lead in doing reporting, even if it's on their own staff. They will report to the state or help doing um, um, liaisons with the ombudsman for additional resources for the client, maybe if they're trying to leave the facility or go home, okay? Um, so we always wanna to try to coordinate as much as possible with the facilities. Um, regarding reportable incidents and any potential staff neglect or anything like that. Um, any concerns regarding clients and facilities will need to be addressed with the DON, so Director of Nursing, or the search worker or admin as soon as possible within four hours. Um, if directed, you will complete an incident notification form and submit to myself and the supervisor that is on the incident hotline by the end of that business day. Um, there may be even times when there may be suicidal or homicidal ideations, um, and there may be some facilities where to cover ourselves or yourself, you may still just do an incident report and document that in the progress note. Um, if there is reporting, then we may not document that in the progress note, but the, um, the supervisor and the incident hotline or myself will tell you on how you should do that documentation on the incident hotline, I'm sorry, on the incident notification form or within the progress note and or both, okay? Um, so if you have any concerns, issues regarding facilities that you're working in um, or reporting for facilities, please make sure you talk to your directors and your supervisors um, so we can um, ensure that you feel confident working with um, in those places, okay? All right, so now we're going to get into development disabilities incident reporting. Um, so this is one of the last videos we're going to be watching for today. This one is from the Ohio Department um, of Development Disabilities, and this one is actually an example of one of the videos that they prepare for their clients, uh, for clients with development disabilities. So you'll notice that it is um, a little bit slower. Okay, um, but it's intentional for to meet their needs, right? So let's watch this one. Abuse, an easy read guide. You have the right to be treated with respect. You have the right to feel safe. It is not okay for someone to hurt or abuse you. What is abuse? Abuse is someone hitting or pushing you. Someone calling you names or yelling at you. Someone bullying you someone keeping you from your family and friends, someone taking money or medicine from you, someone touching you in ways that you do not want to be touched. What can I do? 
tell someone you trust. That could be a friend, someone in your family, someone you live with, your teacher or your boss. Or if you are in danger, call 911. Sometimes the first person you tell might not know how to help you. Don't give up. Tell someone else. Keep telling people until the abuse stops. If you think someone with a disability is being hit, bullied, or picked on, you can call the abuse hotline at your County Board of Developmental Disabilities or the Abuse Hotline at the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities at 1-866-313-6733. You just watched Abuse, an Easy Read Guide. What would you like to do now? Print Abuse Easy Read? see another video okay so like i said they have created a lot of videos um, for the dd population um, there's videos about how to choose a provider their rights as a dd um a development disability uh, disabled disabled um client with the board, with the Service County Board. Um, so they have a bunch of great videos on their website that you can review with your clients if you work with the DD population. But we're going to focus on the reporting aspects of it. Um, so we're going to start off with, it's called an MUI. An MUI stands for Major Unusual Incidents, and it is any alleged, suspected, or actual occurrence for an incident that adversely affects the health and safety of an individual, okay? So all incidents required to be immediate, have immediate action is taken to protect the individual from future harm. An investigation is conducted to determine the cause of the incident and contributing factors. Prevention planning is in place, um, is put in place to reduce the likelihood of future occurrences, okay? So you have MUI and then you have UI. So UI stands for unusual incidents, um, which is an event or occurrence involved clients that is not consistent with routine operation, policy procedures, or the individual's care or individualized service plan. So you may have heard of ISP before with the county board um, and is not a major unusual incident. So a few include dental injuries, falls, an injury that is not, is not a significant injury, medication error with or without likely risk of health and welfare, um, error without um, health and welfare, excuse me. Okay, um, so what's important when you're working with clients with development disabilities? We always need to have a release of information to the county board so we can coordinate care with the client. Um, so as you remember from previous trainings, um, release of information have to be done annually. Um, we want the client, if they're own, their own guardian or the guardian to sign off that we should be coordinating and collaborating with the county board, okay? Um, so the County Board of DD, so each county, so Franklin County Board of DD, Hamilton County Board of DD, um, we want to be able to coordinate, and if it is an incident report, we're going to contact that local county board of MUI. Um, yeah. So once again, DODD regulates every county, local county board of DD. Um, the local county board of DD is responsible for immediate action investigations and prevention planning for each incident. So there are two different reporting processes when we have clients who have a DD diagnosis, okay? So you guys may be aware that we have sister companies, day and residential. Um, they also serve clients who have development disabilities. So with our sister companies, we're gonna always coordinate and collaborate when we're doing incident reports, okay? 
Um, so the beginning part is the same as any other as anything else. Um, we're always going to contact the incident hotline um, within one hour discovery. If the client is in our residential, so ViaQuest Residential Services, VRS, or Day and Employment Services, VDES, um, the supervisor on the incident hotline will contact the management of that sister company to discuss if this would be an MUI or UI, okay? So there are some clients who have behaviors um, where they have a behavior plan where it would uh, maybe an MUI for a one client may be considered a UI for another client. So self-harming behaviors or something like that, for example. Um, so for those clients, um, we may just have them do an incident report, fill that out as a witness statement, and then our sister companies will track in their behavior tracking and or um, do it as a UI, okay? But we always want to review their ISPs from the county board, not the ones in our system as the care plans, um, but we want to review the county board's ISP, their service plan, on if this is a reportable incident or not. Um, with the discussion with management, um, we always want our sister companies to take the leads in doing reports to the MUI, okay? So they will call MUI within four hours of discovery of the incident. There is a rare occasion where we may take the lead in doing the report, um, but that is going to be with approval from the supervisor and the incident hotline, okay? Um, VPS employees will complete the incident notification form or do a witness statement on the incident notification form by the end of that business day and send the QA and training director and supervisor on hotline. Um, and supervisor and hotline will send today our residential services management team, and then them will collaboratively collect all incident report forms and send that to the county board on behalf of all of ViaQuest. Okay. Um, so these, um, with working with our sister companies, sometimes they can be a little confusing, but that's why it's really important to make sure you're contacting a supervisor on the incident hotline to making sure that we are both reporting in a timely manner and things are being handled appropriately, okay? So if it's a non-ViaQuest sister company client, so they have a developmental disability diagnosis, but they are not part of our day services or residential. This is the reporting process for that, okay? So the, the beginning is the same. You'll contact the incident hotline within one hour discovery. Um, you'll discuss it with the supervisor on the incident hotline. If this may be an MUI or UI based on the client's ISP from the county board, um, if we're able to, and if you guys have a release of information with any other residential or day services that they attend, um, we may want to coordinate with them to see if they've already reported the incident, see if they're aware of it, and it has been reported. Um, if it has been reported, then we want to make sure that we get copies um, of the incident form that they did to the MUI. If we're not able to get a hold of them, um, or they are not able to provide that evidence, then with directions of the supervisor on the incident hotline, you will contact the MUI department where the client resides within four hours. So each county has their own MUI line, okay? Um, when you're contacting them and you're telling them about the report, you also wanna ask them who you would like the written report sent to. There may be times where they um, don't want the incident report, they'll take it over the phone and they'll do that in the system directly but there may be times like specifically like after hours where they'll ask you to send it to them directly or certain counties have an MUI at H you know Mount uh, you know Hamilton County Board of DD.org or something like that um, so you want to ask them where do they want you to send it to um, there may be times so especially like in the smaller counties where they'll just have you leave a voicemail and then they'll contact you back um, and that is okay. So make sure you leave a full detailed um, voicemail with no PHI. So just saying, hi, this is Gabrielle from ViaQuest, working with a client um, who receives services from this county board. We would like to discuss an incident. If you could please call me back at this number. Okay. 
Um, so once you're done with all the contacting and coordinating of care, um, you'll complete the incident notification form and that will also still need to be sent to me by the end of that business day. Um, as a reminder, if we are sending an email to the county board or to anybody outside of ViaQuest, we always wanna put secure in the subject line of the email, okay? Now we're going to go get into ODMHAS. So what does it stand for? Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So they certify us, PBS, to be a community mental health organization in Ohio. They provide statutory and regulation authorities um, over, provi over providers in Ohio. So they manage all community mental health agencies, residential facilities, and inpatient psychiatric service providers. Um, I did provide the website down there, um, mha.ohio.gov. Um, if you go on their website, there's a lot of great resources on there, okay? Um, they have things on there for families. Um, if, you're, if your client is maybe moving to another county, they have all the agencies in Ohio in there. And they have their numbers and address and everything like that. So you can provide referrals to clients. They also have resources for clinicians too um, and initiatives. Um, so um, every once in a while, they'll do a new initiative. So they had one about um, human trafficking, and they even had a free CE, continued education on human trafficking. They had some on, on gambling um, and internet addiction. So they have a bunch of great trainings on there that you can um, look through their website at any time. So us as an agency has to keep track of different types of incidents. Um, and there are certain things that we have to report to, um, to state. Um, and these are some of the things that you may have to report, okay? Um, so abuse and neglect by staff, including allegations for physical, sexual, defraud, or neglect. Death of the client. So if it is a suicide, or they accidentally die on our inner care or at our offices, or if there's a homicide by a client, so if a client kills somebody else. Medication errors or adverse drug reactions resulting in permanent client harm, hospitalization, or death. So this one is more targeted to our prescribers. Um, so if, 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 you're prescribing something and that one of those three things potentially happen, then you'll report that to me um, and then we'll report it to state there. Uh, theft of a medication, including allegations by employee, by client or other unknown theft. Medication diversion, selling drugs on premises, missing and unaccounted for medications. This is all about medications and drugs. Sexual assaults by non-staff, including visitors, client, or others. Physical assault, including injury by non-staff, including visitors, clients, or others, when emergency unplanned medical intervention or hospitalization is given. Involuntary termination of treatment by provider without appropriate care involved. Um, so for example, without informing the client, providing a reason and offering a referral. Medical event impacting provider operations. Temporary closure of one or more provider sets for more than seven consecutive days. So this one you guys don't need to worry about. Um, myself and management will make sure that this is done. But if we have to close one of our offices um, due to fire, disaster, flooding, or anything like that, tornado um, breaks down the building or something like that, we'll, we'll notify them. Then it gets into seclusion and restraints. So as you guys hopefully are aware, um, we, all staff members are Aegis certified. Um, we are not wanting to do seclusion and restraints on clients. And we should not be doing that as much as we can. If you are at one of our residential or day services or one of our DD clients, we always want to make sure that their staff members are doing any type of physical de-escalations with the clients and that we are not involved. Um, you know, if the client is, um, worst case scenario, charging you, you want to self-defend yourself and your safety, right? Um, but we always want to make sure that we're doing our Aegis training um, and that we're doing it as a last resort, okay? 
So it's the and restraints. So these are things that we have to report regarding exclusion and restraints to the board. Um, so related to injury to the client. So injury requiring first aid, requiring um, emergency unplanned medical interventions or hospitalization. Seclusion and restraints related to a death. Death during the seclusion and restraints, within 24 hours of the seclusion and restraints, and it relates to as a result of the seclusion or restraint. Use of seclusion and restraint by a provider without prior notification that the provider remits the use of seclusion and restraint and inappropriate use of the seclusion or restraint. So inappropriate use of the seclusion, physical restraint, mechanical restraint, or a transitional hold. And then inappropriate use or restraint, uh, restraint techniques um, or other use of force. So behavior management interventions that employ unpleasant um, stimuli, uh, any technique that obstructs vision, or a drug or medication that is used as a restraint and it's not a standard treatment or dosage. Inappropriate use or restraint techniques or other use of force. So the use of handcuffs or weapons, any techniques that obstruct the airway or impair breathing, any techniques that restrict communication, use of mechanical restraints on a client age 18, under 18 and re-traumatization. So when we do reports for Ohio Department um, ODMHIS, um, they are gonna be wanting additional information. And these are some things that I, we will either get from the chart or that we would ask you about. So we always wanna know if there is other people involved, their race, ethnicity, age, gender, if they're the perpetrator or the victim, any additional information about the incident, and then that will be sent to me, okay? So all documents will be sent to QA and training director and not put in the client's chart, okay? Um, so for incident reports, um, you will follow the process as, as always. So contacting the incident report line within one hour discovery, um, not leaving, uh, leaving it a voicemail with no PHI, um, and contacting them and contacting me at the last resort if possible. Um, the difference with this one is that you will not be contacting ODMHAS, okay? Um, for the, um, when we're doing um, MHAS reports, it's one person per agency. So I am the a point person for ODMHAS reports. Um, so you and the supervisor on the incident hotline will notify me of this report. Um, and then you complete your incident report form by the end of that business day, and that that will need to be sent to me and let me know that I need to report it to ODMHAS, okay? So I may call you later on that day to get additional information if I'm unclear um, or need you to make any changes to your incident report form, um, if it needs to be worded a certain way, um, and you'll maybe be in contact with me directly about that, okay? Let's get into CARF. So CARF stands for Commissions of Accreditation of, Re of Rehabilitation Facilities. Um, CARF is international. They're in the United States, Canada, Europe. And it is a group of private nonprofit companies that accredit health and human services. So they mostly go by the acronym of CARF. They don't really go back by their full name, um, but they adhere to their mission and values through um, consultative accreditation process and continuous improvement services that center on enhancing the lives of persons served, so our clients. Um, so they have different types of accreditation, including customer service units, in, including aging services, behavior health, which is what we're accredited in, child and youth services, employment and community services, medical rehabilitation and vision rehabilitation services. So they provide accreditation to organizations that demonstrate conformance to the applicable standards, including expire to excellence. So organizations can receive on-site surveys from surveyors from other accredited organizations to see how they conform to the standards. So there's three different types of accreditations that we can receive. 
um, a three-year accreditation, a one-year accreditation, or non-accreditation. Currently, we have a three-year accreditation and have had um, a three-year accreditation since uh, 2007. So we're really proud and great, um, great to um, state that. So um, VPS has general accreditation of services, including medication use for psych services and these additional accreditations. So we're accredited to provide outpatient treatment. So that's our therapy services for children, adolescents, and adults, case management services, service coordination. So that's our TBS, CPST, and then crisis, crisis intervention for adults. So now we're gonna get on to what is reportable for CARF, okay? So medication error. So same thing as ODMHAS. Um, any medication errors that um, includes hospitalization, death, or adverse reactions, any type of uses, inclusions, or restraints, incidents involving injury, communicable disease, infection control, aggression or, or violence, use, and unauthorized possession of weapons, wandering, and overdose. Okay, so I noticed that some of these ones wouldn't really apply to us regarding like specifically like wandering, um, but these are different things that we have to notate, even if it's something that doesn't really apply to our organization. Elopement, vehicle accidents, biohazardous accidents, unauthorized use and possession of legal or, or legal substances, abuse, neglect, substance or suicide, um, suicide and attempted suicide, excuse me, hospitalizations and session, pink slips, sexual abuse or sexual assault, and any concerns that needs to be addressed for client care. Okay, so for CARF, if, if incident is also notated previously, ensure you follow the regulation of that department. So there may be times to like um, child abuse, where we would report to CPS, but we would also notate it for CARF, okay? Um, do not, uh, we do not have to report directly to CARF. Um, so you'll just contact the incident hotline, let them know that you are aware of this incident. Um, if you do have to report to the previous, any departments, you'll do that. But just for CARF, you'll just notate that on the incident notification form that you're doing it for CPS and for CARF, okay, for an example. Once again, that report needs to be done by the end of that business day. And that's it for CARF. So once again, there is, you will not contact CARF directly saying, you know, this abuse happened and I reported to CPS. That just needs to be done on the incident notification form and that is going to be emailed to me, okay. So let's move into felonies and criminal acts. Last, but uh, two more things and then we're done for today. So felonies. So first degree felonies are the most serious categories while fifth degree felonies are the least serious. Um, there are two felonies that are identified that are not identified by the degree, okay? So felonies are broken down into five categories. You'll see the first degree there is three to, six, three to 11 years, maximum of $20,000, okay? All the way down to the fifth degree that can, they can serve up to six to 12 months, okay? Um, maximum fine of 2,500. So as I said earlier, there's two um, felonies that are not classified in the degrees, which is aggravated murder. Um, they can um, be sentenced to death to life without parole, um, possibility of parole after 20 years. Murder is 15 years in prison to life, in prison without parole, okay? Um, so give me an examples of different type of felonies here. And once again, unclassified felonies is considered aggravated murder and murder. Um, first degree felonies are considered as, these are some examples of rape, voluntary manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter and kidnapping. Some examples of second degree, illegal manufacturing uh, or uh, processing explosive, soliciting prostitutions after a positive HIV test, abduction. Third degree can include reckless homicide, robber, robbery, and theft of anhydrous ammonia. Um, so that's like the development of meth. 
Fourth degree felony is unlawful sexual conduct with a minor, safe cracking, grand theft of a motor vehicle, vehicle assault. Fifth degree felonies include breaking and entering and gambling. Okay. So more so like legal gambling, right? So why, why are we talking about felonies? Um, because clients may report that they have been involved with or um, or have committed a, a crime, right? Um, so what do you do when client reports those things? So according to regulation, if you are a physician, nurse practitioner, licensed counselor, counselors, LPC or LPCC, licensed social worker, LSW, LISW, we are privileged by reason of the therapeutic relationship who are not required to disclose this information, but be mindful of duty to warn, duty protect, and future harm of abuse, maltreatment, and other violent acts, okay? Um, so if it's more so like a pass item, um, you can be protected under the therapeutic relationship to not require to disclose it unless we have to warn and be protective of future harm, okay? Um, towards somebody. Um, so all of our other staff members, you have to follow the ORC 2921.22. Um, so basically it's stating, so no person knowingly that a felony has been or is being committed shall knowingly fail to report to law enforcement authorities. Okay. So especially our TBS workers, if clients um, start to say, hey, you know, I think I broke the law or I did this really bad thing, um, it would best to potentially stop them and say, maybe this is a conversation for your therapist, or maybe you need to talk to your nurse practitioner about this, um, unless they are wanting your assistance with turning themselves in. Okay. So for any felonies that you need to report, or if you need guidance on if you should or shouldn't report for therapists and NPs, you can contact the incident hotline for them to assist you through that process on if it's a reportable, if you should report it to law enforcement or not. Um, for TBS and other positions, you guys will need to follow the incident report line and you will have to report that um, to law enforcement of the felony that may and is going to take place. Okay. Um, so once again, you will do that within one hour of discovery. Um, you will contact within four hours and you will do that incident report form to me by the end of that business day. Last but not least is we're going to talk about animal abuse. Um, so there is a newer regulation, ORC 959.07, where we are having to report violations involving a companion animal, okay? So we're going to report to an officer who is not a dog warden or a deputy dog warden. Um, so may, most likely the local um, animal shelters is what we're going to be doing reporting to. If there is knowledge or reasonable cause or suspect that violates violation that occurring, occur, that has occurred or is occurring, okay? So the abuse, neglect, um, like dog fighting, right? Um, not able to take care of them or abusing them in any type of way. You will still follow the reporting process. So contacting the incident hotline, you will do that within one hour discovery. If you are directed, you will contact the local animal control agency, okay? Um, within four hours. Then you will complete the incident notification form and submit to myself and the supervisor incident hotline by the end of that business day. Okay. All right, so last but not least that we're gonna do today is learn how to fill out the incident notification form. So once again, I asked you at the beginning of this training to make sure that you have a printout or you have the electronic version of the incident notification form. Um, I'm going to show you how to complete each section of the form. Um, so when you do have to do an incident report form, you know how to complete it correctly. Okay. So we're going to start on the back. We're going to start on the back of the form. Um, so if you go to page two, um, at the top of it, it's a reminder. 
okay, of types of incidents. So a reminder, all incidents need to be called into the incident hotline immediately or within one hour of discovery. With approval and discussion with the supervisor and the incident hotline, staff will contact MUI, CPS, or APS departments and or others as directed within four hours of discovery. This incident report needs to be sent to the department the provider, LTC, et cetera, if requested um, the supervisor to the supervisor on the incident hotline and the QA and training director by the end of that business day. Remember to put secure in subject line of your email when emailing to outside of ViaQuest. So we're gonna go through that, okay? Then on the, the rest of that second page is just a reminder of everything that we just reviewed. So, um, and how you're, um, and then how you're gonna notate that on the incident form in the next slide, okay? So facility reports, car, children services, adult services, MUI, ODMHAS, so that's everything we just reviewed today. And that is for how you're gonna complete it on the type of incident, okay? So this is the top, so if you go back to page one, of the incident notification form. This is the top of the form, okay? So as a reminder, it states, do not put in the client's chart. You need to contact the incident hotline prior to filling this out and sending this form. So at the top there, you'll see the region. So those are examples of the region. So central, west, south, east, okay? You're gonna put the region that you are in. So date and time. So the date and time you were notified, okay? Um, of the incident. So not when it took place, but when you were notified of the incident. The client name or the or the person that you're filling this form out for. Age you can get from Smart Care, the address you can get from Smart Care, which is our current EHR. Okay. Guardian, hopefully you know who the guardian is. If not, you can definitely get that from Smart Care also. And then you're gonna put your name down saying that you're the one that's completing this form and you're gonna do the report or this witness statement, okay? The provider, you're always gonna put down who we're coordinating with. So is it the day, maybe VDES, VRS, the LTC? Um, we always wanna make sure that we have a release of information for all these people, okay? Especially if it's an outside provider. Um, if it's not applicable, you'll see right underneath there, it says if applicable, so you can put NA. Location of incident. So this is where the incident took place, okay? So not where your session took place, but where the client is disclosing the incident took place, okay? Type of incident. Um, so put items in bold and type of incident. So for example, CPS slash abuse, okay? So the item in bold, so go back to the previous page, the item in bold, and then the incident you're gonna put there. Also another reminder there, if it is a car thing, you're gonna put CPS and car, okay? Abuse. Name of involved individuals, witness, if, so it says if other clients put their initials, staff or other employees can be listed here too. Okay, so if it was two TBS that were involved and were notified of the incident, you can put yourself in the fill out section and then the other TBS in this section here. Okay. Then your next section of the incident notification form. So give details of what happened in session, describe description of the issues and ensure the client is safe prior to calling the incident hotline. Um, can attach additional pages or Word documents if everything um, does not fit in this box. You should always contact the incident hotline and the yes box below should be checked. You can electronically sign it or if handwritten, please sign below email before emailing. Um, if having issues, contact IT to have, you, have them help you figure out your signature. So you'll notice that there is that red line there. Um, you have to open it up in Adobe for you to get that red line. If you're opening it up in Google Chrome, um, the signature red line there will not show. The next section, follow-up and resolution. So give information of re resolution. Notate it if you contacted APS, CPS, et cetera. If there was any communication with providers to ensure the client's safety, um, that can be put here. Please also put if there is any follow-up that will be done. So like scheduling. Um, team meetings, calling guardian teams, um, 
scheduling follow-ups after admission to the hospital, um, completing safety plan at next visit, et cetera. So all that will go in this section here. Then at the bottom, um, this is what we need you to fill out. So call to notify of the incident. Um, so the incident hotline. So whoever that you called in the incident hotline, they'll give you their name and the time, the date that you called them. Um, you always wanna make sure that your supervisor is aware of the things that you're doing. So you can call them and then also notify your director. Um, we wanna know the time that you called the department. So CPS, APS, um, uh, animal abuse, um, and then all those other ones as needed. So not all of them may be filled out, but I just provided some examples of how you would fill that out. So we do need the date and the time that you completed it because we want to make sure that you're reporting in a timely manner. And we're going to compare these times here at the bottom versus the time of the incident of discovery at the top. And you'll notice is a big back line there. That is to distinguish that you were done. Okay, so I have to review every incident and then I will put my name and sign it there at the bottom that I reviewed it. Okay, after you email it to me. So just in case you don't understand what the secure means, this is what an email would look like. So you would put who you're sending it to me, sending it to, and then you're CCing me. So Gabrielle Bryson is CC'd. And the subject line. So in the subject, you'll see right there, subject, secure semicolon. And then you can put MUI or consent. You'll do that same thing for consent or release some information. When we're sending Anything with PHI, so public health information, we always have to put secure in the subject line so it's encrypted and they would have to have a username and password in order to access that email, okay? So I wanted to make sure you guys understood what that meant. And that is the end of the training. Um, so once again, please complete your quiz and sign off. Um, please make sure that you turn in your example or your incident notification form and review that with your supervisor that you understand and know how to complete that um, when and if you ever have to do an incident notification form. Um, these are my resources um, of different things that I use to create this training to make sure that we're staying in compliance. We use the regulations and everything like that. Um, I appreciate you guys attending this training. I wish you success in your position here at ViaQuest. Um, and I hope you don't have to do too many re reports, but if you do, we'll be here for you. Thank you and have a great day.